share all of my bourbon real talk listeners and watchers. Randy Sullivan here with a topic that is going to just fascinate the world, and that is the top seven most polarizing whiskeys. So let me say from the jump that the purpose of the Bourbon Real Talk channel is to bring people together through whiskey. Nothing about what I do is meant to cause division or separation. So all the information in this podcast that I share is going to be shared in a way that's informative, but not divisive, uh, because I don't want someone who likes one of these whiskeys to feel alienated or anything like that. Um, I will also explain why the purpose of the channel is to bring people together at the end. It's a pretty compelling story. People that have heard it seem to like it. So if for whatever reason you get bored in the middle of this recording, please don't give up. At the very least, use the chapters that are in your little play feed to click on the end and watch the section that says outro so that you can understand the purpose of the channel. With all that being said, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. So the first whiskey in my seven most polarizing whiskeys that we're going to talk about is right here. It is Willet Pot Still. Now, Willet Pot Still is distilled by Kentucky Bourbon Distillers, generally referred to as KBD. It is a non-age stated product, but when I was doing research on it, I did see some information that said that it was aged between eight and 10 years, which I have a very hard time accepting as truth. So if there's somebody out there that can independently confirm or deny this information, please throw it in the comments or you can reach out to us on the website or PM us on Facebook or something. I'd be very curious to find that out. This product is proofed at 94 proof points. Uh, which is, you know, I, I like to drink things typically above 100, but uh, 94 is still solid. Uh, tasting notes on this are this whiskey is extremely fruity, extremely floral, and it's got a lot of baking spice notes to it. So the way that I would describe this whiskey would be something similar to like a Four Roses, but like turned up to 10, right? Um, and that's part of the reason why it can be so polarizing is because it doesn't necessarily taste like traditional Kentucky bourbon. So some factoids about Willet. Um, it was formed in 1936, which I didn't know until I started doing research. Um, and in the early 80s, it was purchased by a family. And I'm, I hope that I'm saying this right. Uh, Kulsveen is, I think, the last name. Uh, and that's when they started operating under the KBD name. Um, they have several other products that they produce. They produce Noah's Mill, Rowan's Creek, Johnny Drum, Old Bardstown Bourbon, Pure Kentucky, and Kentucky Vintage. And another interesting factoid is right around the time that the uh, Coolsvane family took over, uh, the distillery stopped producing their own spirits. In the late 70s, they had a... a a, uh, they tried a new business model where they were producing alcohol that was supposed to be used for fuel for cars. It failed. When that failed, they kind of shut down their, their production facility, and they operated largely as an independent bottler from the 80s into the early 2010s. So other manufacturers would make their whiskey, they'd ship it over to Willet, and Willet would put it in bottles for them, label it, and so on and so forth. So if you didn't know, there's a lot of distilleries that don't bottle their own whiskey, they send it to independent bottlers. They also operated as a non-distiller producer, so they would buy whiskey from other brands, bring it in, some of it be aged in their facilities, whatever, and then they bottle it up under their own labels. But in 2012, they fired their stills back up. They had some Vendome stills made. <clears throat> and um, that's where, you know, this image comes from. So this is a Willet pot still. So there still was a pot still. It is pot still whiskey. There are reports, though, that the first run of this, because whiskey is typically distilled twice. So the first time it produces the, uh, the low wines and then the second time the high wines. Uh, the rumor is that the first run of this is actually not done on a pot still. It's done on a column still. Again, that's just a rumor. I don't know if that's true. And then the second run is on a pot still. So the question is, is like, why is this so divisive? Now, this is a whiskey that when I taste it, I don't taste any flavors that are off-putting to me. Um, I think that the reason why this whiskey draws so much scrutiny is because possibly it starts with the bottle. So this bottle is a very elegant looking bottle. It's shaped exactly like the pot still that the whiskey supposedly made on. 
And as a result, it attracts a lot of new people, right? So new people walk in, they see this beautiful bottle and they're like, boom, I'm gonna try this guy. Um, and then the whiskey enthusiasts have kind of been in the game for a while. Look at that as a little bit gimmicky, maybe. Also, I think this is a higher rye bourbon, um, but there's definitely more grain flavor in this whiskey than most Kentucky bourbons. And it's very spicy. So <clears throat> I one time did a blind tasting with this where I sent out sample packs to random individuals and I recorded their results. And when I paired this against other whiskeys, I didn't pair it against Kentucky bourbons because it does taste quite different from Kentucky bourbon. But with that extra spice, I threw it up against some common rye products that people seem to like, and it finished right in the middle. And so from my estimation, this is a whiskey that has gotten a bad rap. Um, I don't think it's bad whiskey. I drink it regularly. I enjoy it. It is a lot fruitier, a lot more floral than most Kentucky bourbons. But with the different manufacturing process of being made on a pot still versus a column still, in my estimation, it's probably what the producer was intending and it tastes the way that it's supposed to. And if it's not for you, that's okay, but there's no reason to hate on somebody who does like this whiskey. Up next, we have George Dickel. George Dickel is priced at about $25.99 per bottle uh, for a for $7.50. What I've got here is a handle because that's all that was available in the store that I was able to find this product at. It is distilled by the Dickel Distillery. This bottling is bottled at 90 proof. And the main tasting note for me for George Dickel is, wait for it, Flintstone Vitamins. So this particular whiskey, it can be blended with other whiskeys. It can be by itself. It can be put in a different bottle. If you pour it for me and you hand me the glass and I smell it, I'll hand it back to you and tell you that's Dickel because all I can smell is B vitamin elements. Um, some people perceive this differently. Some people, the Dickel flavor for them comes across as peanuts and I've heard a few people say even chocolate. Some factoids about Dickel, it was started by the Shinley Corporation, which was this huge conglomerate that really grew very quickly post-prohibition. And they tried to purchase the Jack Daniels distillery in the late 50s and failed. And so they said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna take one of our brands that originally operated in the Tennessee area. They reopened the distillery and they started making George Dickel. I think their first release was in 1964. Um, I also find it pretty interesting that they do not have an E in the name whiskey. Uh, most American producers spell it, you know, K-E-Y. Overseas, typically it's just K-Y. Uh, but they say that they decided to leave the E out because they wanted consumers to know that their whiskey was just as good as the best scotch. They do use the Lincoln County process, which means that after they get done distilling the whiskey, they will, will filter it through uh, sugar maple charcoal. So sugar maple is a particular type of tree. They will you know, burn it and turn it into charcoal and then they will filter the new distillate, the new make whiskey through that charcoal before they proof down and put it in the barrel. And basically, mo many people think that this process like flash ages the whiskey because it's getting so much exposure to charred wood but it's actually more like pumping the stomach of somebody that had ingested poison, right? Because it's not imparting anything from the sugar maple. The whiskey comes out the other side like completely clear, but it, it filters out and absorbs things out of the whiskey that the producers think are going to make the whiskey taste better in the end. Now, people from Kentucky believe that the Lincoln County process, for the most part, removes things from the whiskey that are going to impart good flavors later. Um, so that's kind of the battle between Tennessee. But as a result, this whiskey is not labeled as bourbon. It is labeled as Tennessee whiskey because it's made in Tennessee and it follows the rest of the requirements set up by the state of Tennessee to be called Tennessee whiskey. But this whiskey is most often bottled as bourbon whenever it gets sold to other producers to bottle it in their bottle. Um, and so... You know, Diageo is the current owner of this brand. Diageo is this huge beverage conglomerate. They own many other brands. And in the late 1990s, they realized that they had too much inventory aging for the amount of demand that they had for the, for the brand. And since then, they actually shut down production for a while. And then when they picked back up, they had higher age stock that they could use in their own product. 
and they had a higher age stock that they could sell to other people. And ever since then, when they pick production back up, everything that they have coming down the pipeline has been a higher age than your average distillery, especially in Tennessee. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of other brands, non-distiller producers that built their brand for the most part by buying high age MGPI product. And now they can't get the high age MGPI product and they're buying a lot of Dickel and they're bottling it. And that's sometimes why people get upset. Um, and so I think that it's very possible that you as a whiskey enthusiast drinker could taste this whiskey and decide that that note, whatever it comes across to you, whether it's B vitamin or it's peanuts or whatever, that that's not for your palate and that's okay. But I think that another reason why this whiskey gets so much hate is because you used to be able to get its ultra premium bottlings for around $40, $45. And now they're selling that same whiskey to another company that's going to put it in a bottle that you recognize the name, but they're asking $180 for it. You buy it thinking that it's one thing and then you taste it and it's another. And so I think that that might be part of the reason why there's a little bit of a backlash against this. Okay, up next, we have Garrison Brothers. This is their standard small batch offering. It comes in at $79.99, so it's on the more expensive side, especially for the products that we're talking about today. It is distilled and bottled by Garrison Brothers Distillery in High, Texas, and it is a non-age stated product. But as you can see on the bottle, it says that it is a straight bourbon, which means that it has to be at least two years if there's an age statement. I've searched the entire bottle. There's not an age statement. To do it that way, it means that the whiskey must be at least four years old. So we can assume that this is probably just over a four-year-old whiskey. It is bottled at 94 proof. The tasting notes are corn. It is very corn forward. It's very sweet. There's a lot of honey. There's a little bit of cinnamon, orange, and there's some smokiness in there because of the way that they age their barrels. So some factoids, Garrison Brothers ages in 30 gallon barrels. Um, which are a lot smaller than the average Kentucky distillery. The average Kentucky distillery ages in a 53 gallon barrel. And what that does is it increases the, uh, the surface ratio to whiskey, right? So the whiskey is interacting with the barrel faster than it would have in a larger barrel. And that's supposed to speed up the aging process and increase the extraction. But when you couple the smaller barrel with the fact that high is an area of Texas that experiences 90 degree days for about nine months out of the year. That is extreme compared to what the barrels see in Kentucky. And so we've got that whiskey moving in and out of the barrel a lot faster than it would in the traditional bourbon area of Kentucky. You got the smaller barrels with the higher contact ratio. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a lot darker of a whiskey. It's got a whole lot more barrel influence. It doesn't have as much time to develop the more complicated esters and things that you would see in a, you know, Kentucky distillery, because some of those things just take time. It's not about contact with the barrel. The other thing to keep in mind with Garrison Brothers is that this is the first legally licensed whiskey distillery in the state of Texas post prohibition. They also use a pot still to make their whiskeys, um, similar to you know what we saw with the uh, with the Willet pot still. So they use a pot still, and the other thing to keep in mind is that they have a red winter wheat as their flavor grain. So for it to be bourbon, at least fifty one percent corn, and then you've got that second grain in there, and that's what the distillers call the flavor grain. And typically it's rye, but for Garrison Brothers, they went with a red winter wheat, which is actually a a it's a product that imparts a lot of flavor into a whiskey, a lot more than the other varieties of wheat that people use to make, say, a Weller line of product at Buffalo Trace. And so, it, you know, it's, it's a, this whiskey in general is a very grain forward whiskey. So um, part of the reason why it kind of bothers me that people get so upset about Garrison Brothers is when you think about distilleries. If you are forming a distillery in an area that's not Kentucky, especially you're the first one since Prohibition, there is no roadmap. You know, they don't tell you this is how you make whiskey that tastes like Texas whiskey. You just have to figure it out, right? And typically people are starting off with a 
pot still and not with a column still. And so right away, you're gonna end up with way more grain flavor. They're usually using local sourced grains, and so you're gonna have different grain varietals than you're used to in a Kentucky bourbon and so on and so forth. So when you take into consideration that you just kind of got to figure it all out and to even have an Annie at the table, you had to risk your entire life. You had to risk your entire future. You had to invest every single second of every day that you have for the foreseeable future. You had to invest every penny that you've ever made in your entire life, all because you had this passion to bring this thing to life. Um, And when you look at the way that they decided to make their whiskey, it's pretty obvious that they never intended to make a whiskey that tasted like Kentucky bourbon. They're using different grains. They're using different, um, a different still. They're using different barrels. They're using, it's a different aging environment. Everything that they do is different. They were not trying to make something that if you only liked Kentucky bourbon, you'd taste their whiskey and go, oh, this, this is the best Kentucky bourbon tasting whiskey ever, but it's from Texas. Um, it, it, that's not the case. Way more grain forward, way more sweet flavors from the corn. And I'll tell you this, this whiskey goes pretty darn good with Texas barbecue. Um, it's sweet enough to stand up to even like the little bit of spice that we get in our barbecue sauce here. Um, it is a pretty high price as well. So if you're talking about a, a bottle that's seventy nine ninety nine. That is a very high price when you look at what you can get for that price range from one of the legacy Kentucky distilleries. And so I think that that's part of the reason for the hate towards this whiskey. One, it doesn't taste like people expect it to taste because people have an image in their head of what bourbon is supposed to be. They taste this, it doesn't line up with it, and they're like, whoa, this is way off profile. Doesn't necessarily mean that any of the flavors inside the whiskey are not palatable, but it doesn't line up with what their expectation is. And then you couple that with the fact that it's two to three times as expensive as a leg- legacy distillery would produce for their small batch product. And you got right away, you're upsetting some people and you're fighting an uphill battle. But I will tell you this, Garrison Brothers has been operating, I think for about 12 years now. And in those 12 years, they only had one year that they showed a profit. Um, they're still operating at a loss. So if any of you out there think that the price is what it is because they're greedy and they're trying to line their pockets, you're wrong. They're just trying to survive as a small business and operating inside the liquor space is very difficult to, to make a profitable business. And so the price is what it is because it's craft and everything that they do costs more than it would if they were one of the large legacy distilleries that were in Kentucky. And the, all of that cost translates to a higher bottle cost for consumers. Next up, we've got TX Blended Whiskey. The price on this for a 750 is $28.99. The distillery is Firestone and Robertson Distilling Co. And they are located in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, it is a blended whiskey, so it's non-age stated. In fact, in a lot of people's opinion, it's not even really whiskey, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. It is 82 proof, and the main tasting note on this And you may have to go out and get a sample of this to taste it to confirm this. But to me, it tastes exactly like Captain Crunch cereal if you put vodka in it instead of milk, okay? There's a lot of honey flavor in it. There's some banana flavor that comes out, which is a compound called isoamyl acetate. Um, But, you know, it it, it tastes like a corn-based cereal to me. Uh, very sweet profile, but because it's only 82 proof, it's very light and approachable. Some factoids about this distillery. Um, the distillery owns a trademark for the mark, but not the name, because you cannot trademark the name TX Whiskey, because there's a lot of other companies that can put that on their bottle legally because they make whiskey in Texas. So the image itself is trademarked, but the name is not. So I just found that interesting. Also, they have a handmade cork. So the top of every one of the corks has leather, like recycled leather uh, that's been fitted into it. Used to be all boot leather, but you know, they've gotten big enough now that they've had to find some different sources of leather. Um, It is a blended whiskey, which with the names that are on here, what we know about it is it's between 20 and 50% bourbon. And the rest is grain neutral spirit and they are allowed to you know, add coloring, additives, things like that. So this whiskey has definitely been adulterated. We don't know exactly what it was adulterated with, but this is kind of like a, a vodka base that you added some whiskey to and coloring and flavorings to try and build a profile. 
So it is, you know, a whole lot cheaper to make a blended whiskey in the United States than it is to make actual bourbon. And it has actually made this distillery grow very quickly. You know, the, the, the distilleries have figured out that if you are representative of a state, the people that live in that state want to support that product. Um, and so they were able to grow a pretty nice brand. And to their credit, Firestone and Robinson have taken that growth and they are, they are investing in a future of real Texas bourbon. And they have started to participate, participate more with the other distilleries that are in the state. And I'm hoping that they'll join the Texas Whiskey Association and be a stop on the Texas Whiskey Trail. Um, their, their distillery is doing some very interesting things. Uh, the facility itself is really beautiful. They built the distillery inside a pre-prohibition era warehouse. They restored it. It's gorgeous. Um, this whiskey is a whole lot more like a Crown Royal than it is like a bourbon, in my opinion. Even though it's it's a blended bourbon, the lightness of it, the fact that you can taste that grain neutral spirit, so it, it, you can taste that it had kind of a vodka base. Um, you know, but in all fairness. This is another whiskey that there aren't any flavors in it that when you think about the flavor, you go, ooh, that doesn't taste good. I think it has more to do with people comparing the idea of the flavor of a Kentucky bourbon to this particular whiskey. And if they didn't have that expectation and they just judged it based on off of flavor, I think that they would probably think like, ah, oh, it might be a little bit too light for me or whatever, but it's not a bad tasting whiskey. Next up, we have Hudson bourbon. So Hudson Bourbon, and I'm probably going to screw up the name, but uh, their bottle, and pay attention to this price, is $45.99, okay? And that's for a half bottle, a 375 milliliter bottle instead of the standard 750 that we're used to. So really, this bottle is closer to $92 if you were going to compare it to the same size of all the other bottles we're going to discuss, and that's pretty expensive. Um, the distillery is Tooseltown. Uh, I may be saying that wrong. Spirits. Uh, it is made in upstate New York. It is non-age stated, but it does say on the label that it's below four years. And since there isn't a uh, number on there for how long it actually is aged, it can't be listed as a straight. It's 92 proof. The tasting notes on this are corn, honey, cinnamon, orange. There's a little bit of smoke. And ironically, I find this one's tasting notes to be pretty similar to Garrison Brothers. In fact, there's a lot of similarities between these two distilleries, even though one's in New York and one is in Texas. Um, some factoids, this whiskey is also made on a pot still. Uh, they also use small barrels. I saw something online that said three gallons. I don't think that's true. It's probably 30 if I had to guess. They were also the first legally licensed whiskey distillery in the state of New York post-prohibition, just like Garrison Brothers was the first in Texas legally licensed. So, you know, same sort of a situation. When you're the first to do something, there's no roadmap. They didn't know how to make great New York bourbon. And so they did what they wanted to do, and they're trailblazers, right? They risk everything to be able to do this thing. It was never meant to taste like Kentucky bourbon. Again, their, their, their grains are different. Their processes are different. Their barrels are different. Same sort of a thing. And I think that the main reason to hate this was that they started operations in 2003. And this was really before the resurgence of bourbon happened in the United States. It was just at the very beginning phases of it. And I think that there were a number of people that had just become aware of bourbon being a spirit that they wanted to pursue. And when they saw, you know, Hudson bourbon from the state of New York and they tried it and it wasn't like all of the beautiful Kentucky bourbons that they just tasted, that it kind of turned them off. I also think it's a major issue how much it cost. So, you know, again, they use the value of state pride to get New Yorkers to start to buy the whiskey. They've been able to expand out. Um but, you know, they do have their loyal customers out there. In fact, all of these bourbons have their, their not, not just bourbons, but all these whiskeys have their loyal customers out there. In fact, there was one of them that I had to borrow a bottle of because I couldn't find one in the stores. I went to four stores. I couldn't find a single bottle of it, even though it's one of the most polarizing whiskeys. And so I, I really respect what these guys are doing. 
Um, I will admit that this whiskey is a little too grain forward for me. It's not exactly to my profile, but that doesn't mean that somebody that likes it should be embarrassed about liking it because it was made with a profile that's meant to match up with a certain percentage of people and it doesn't have to match up with 100% of people. All right, next up, we have Basil Hayden's. That is priced at $31.99. It is distilled by Jim Beam. That's right, Jim Beam makes Basil Hayden's. It is a non-age stated product, but when it was originally released, it was released as an eight-year-old product. So we can surmise that it's probably a little less than that now. Um, I'm guessing likely six-ish years old. It is an 80 proof whiskey, okay? Which is the lowest of the polarizing whiskeys that we're taking, talking about today. And definitely too low for most enthusiasts to enjoy. I consider this more of a gateway bourbon, something that you know somebody might try when they're first thinking about getting into bourbons. Um, the other thing, tasting notes, pepper is a pretty common tasting note, orange peel, cinnamon. There's a light baking spice flavor in here. And honey and caramel is in pretty much every bourbon because of the barrels, but it's noteworthy in this one. It kind of sticks out. The reason why we're getting those baking spice notes is because of the mash bill. It's 27% rye. And so that's a pretty high rye bourbon. Most are around the 10, 15%, something like that. So 27 is pretty high. Um, the other thing that might be causing this bourbon to get a little bit of hate is that it's part of Jim Beam's small batch distillery series, which also includes Knob Creek, Bakers, and Bookers. And I will admit that of those four, this would be my least favorite, but it's also the lowest proof. Now, the ironic thing about Basil Hayden's is that people love Old Granddad. And Old Granddad is a whiskey that's also produced by Jim Beam, not in the small batch series. And it's quite a bit cheaper than the uh, Basil Hayden product. And the guy on the label of old granddad bottles is Basil Hayden, right? And it's, it's the same whiskey. And Basil Hayden was kind of known for making a higher rye mash bill bourbon. And when the brand was resurrected, they went with that. So this is the high rye version of Jim Beam. Now, Old Grandad is non-age stated. The bottle and bond and the Old Grandad 114, which that's the proof of that bottle, is probably, it's gotta be at least four years because it's, it's a straight bourbon. Uh, but I'm guessing, you know, because Jim Beam typically has higher age barrels, um, it, it's probably close to six years old as well. If there is a difference in age between the Basil Hayden's and the Old Grandad, chances are Basil Hayden's is older because it used to be a higher age stated product. And so I find this one interesting that it gets so much hate in the whiskey enthusiast community because it's literally the same as another bottle that's almost on every single whiskey enthusiast list of value bourbons. And so it's the exact same bourbon. The only reason I can find to not like this whiskey is that the proof is just too low. All right, next up, we have Mellow Corn Bottled and Bond Straight Corn Whiskey. This bottle cost me $15.99. I understand it can be bought in some parts of the country for $12. It is distilled by Heaven Hill Distillery, massive distillery in Kentucky that makes many of the products that we know and love. It is non-age stated, but it is a bottled and bond, which means that it is at least four years old. It is 100 proof because bottled and bond has to be bottled at 100 proof. It is a decent tasting whiskey in my opinion. The, the notes on it are pretty basic. It's corn, vanilla, a little bit of banana. Again, nothing in this whiskey that when I taste it, I'm like, oh, this isn't right for my, my palate. It is a little bit lighter. Um, now, what's cool about this whiskey is that it's bottled and bond, right? And if you don't know about bottled and bond, I've got some other pieces that will explain it to you. I think I'm going to do one more piece that's like way more concise. But bottled and bond is like the special forces of spirits, right? So if you think about the military, you have to work your way up in the military and kind of the most respected and, and, and most revered of every branch of military is whatever their special forces are, right? And Bottle and Bond is the special forces of spirits. Um, they have to go jump through the most hoops. They have to do the most work to be able to put that on their label. And so it's kind of, in my mind, the, the type of thing where it's like, 
you might have a preference for one branch of the military over another. Um, and that's cool. But that doesn't mean that you wouldn't respect somebody from the branch that you don't like as much who was in the special forces version of that, right? And in my estimation, that is the only problem with this whiskey is that when people taste this whiskey, they're comparing it to a $20 to $40 bottle of Kentucky straight bourbon, um, maybe even a Kentucky bottled and bond bourbon, not understanding that this isn't bourbon. This is corn whiskey. So the, the mash bill has to be at least 80% corn and it cannot be aged in a new charred oak container. It has to be aged in a used barrel or in a barrel that's not charred because if, if all you did with this distillate was put it in a new charred oak container, it would be bourbon. It wouldn't be corn whiskey. And that's the distinction. And so for me, you know, mellow corn, when you consider how inexpensive it is, when you consider, it's the king of corn bourbon or corn whiskey. Like you, no one should dispute that fact, right? It is the king. It is widely distributed. It is bottled in bond, and there aren't a lot of bottled in bond spirits out there to begin with because the hurdles that you have to jump over are so complicated, and it makes it so expensive to produce it. And they're doing all of that and still selling this whiskey at twelve to sixteen dollars. I mean, that's mind blowing. Um, another little factoid that might be interesting for you is that um, occasionally, for a special account, Heaven Hill will allow somebody to do a mellow corn single barrel. Um, people, there have been more single barrels of Pappy Van Winkle than there have been of mellow corn. And so when, when people kind of want to trash this or whatnot, I really feel like they don't understand bottle and bond. I really feel like they don't understand corn whiskey, and I really feel like they've got a bias towards Kentucky bourbon. And if they would consider the quality price ratio of this product, I feel like they would enjoy it. Here are some of the things that I've noticed tend to turn people off. One, pot still whiskeys. Pot still whiskeys have a much stronger grain forward component to them. Um, Kentucky's flavors are mostly focused on what comes out of the barrel. They use column stills for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part. That strips a lot of that grain flavor out, and then you're able to flavor your whiskey uh, with, with the new charred oak containers over time. And if you're used to those, you know, barrel-focused flavors, and then you try pot still whiskey, it may turn you off. Um, some of these whiskeys had a very high corn content, and that tends to turn people off if they're, you know, used to a more traditional mash bill, or if you're using a corn that's a more flavorful corn than the, you know, Kentucky Dent that most of the Kentucky distillers use. Um, some of the time, the whiskeys on the list are because they have lower proofs. So if, in some instances, those whiskeys have other versions that are at higher proofs that everybody loves, but you proof it down and people kind of turn against it. Um, and another thing to consider is that many of these whiskeys were never intended to taste like Kentucky bourbon at all. And so if that's your, if you're going to judge it based on how much it tastes like, you know, George T. Stagg from Kentucky, you're going to be disappointed almost every time. I will tell you this, if you are ever trying to convince somebody else that they need to not like a whiskey they've told you that they like, or if you're making fun of someone or being disrespectful or rude to somebody because they've expressed that they like a whiskey that you don't like, you need to shut the F up because that's not what the whiskey world is about. So let me tell you what the whiskey world is really about, okay? And I promised you in my intro, that in my outro, I would explain the philosophy of my channel. The philosophy of my channel is to bring people together through whiskey. And the reason why I got so passionate about this is because I had a brother that had served in the military. He got out, he was badly addicted to painkillers. And unfortunately in 2014, he decided to take his own life. And it came as a shock to me and my family. I realized that there's probably people all around us that feel unloved and disconnected from the world around them, just like my brother did. And we also live in a very divided nation right now. Politics has torn families apart, and I just don't see any reason for it, okay? I've also noticed that whiskey tends to bring people together of all walks of life, right? I've been at a party where people of different sexual orientations and colors and religions and everything else were sharing glasses with each other and they didn't even necessarily know each other's names yet. 
They were drinking after each other because whiskey brings people together. And so I always have the same sign off for my podcast because my purpose is to help you feel more connected and to use the connected power of whiskey to get you connected to the community so that you can make new friends and connections, never feel alone, always feel supported. And in my sign off, I'm going to tell you that I love you. I do that because I figure if somebody can hate a stranger that they've never met on the internet, it's just as easy for me to love them. So if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you and I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening.